No, no, every day she cooks. <laughs> okay, live on Facebook. Namaste. I'm Rupa Shah, an assistant professor with the Department of Architecture at Shishi University. I'm also a life skills coach and a yoga trainer with the art of living. So we welcome you to the second session on expert yoga series and initiated by the Department of Yogic Sciences, Faculty of Health and Wellness at Shishi University. So today we have with, her, with us a wonderful personality, Dinesh Kashikar and affectionately known as Kashi. He's one of the directors of the teacher's training for the global Sri Sri School of Yoga. He has over 15 years of expertise in training aspiring yoga teachers. And I'm very proud to say that I'm also one of his students. He was one of my trainers on my training program. He's, a mem uh, he's an alumnus of IIT Mumbai, a tech geek, a coder, a foodie, loves eating sweets, loves making people laugh by his virtual tickling, a persona who is full of humility, simplicity, and yet so, so profound. And you know, his favorite one-liner is, what is the point of doing yoga if you can't even eat chocolates? So we welcome you, Kashi Bhaiya, to the session. Thank you really for taking out time for us. Thank you, Rupal. That was a very, very sweet and nice introduction. And I, it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you on the Shishu University website, on the Shishu University Facebook page. And for me, it's, uh, it's really something so dear because uh, I've had the good fortune of being associated with the university since its inception. And it's so nice. Go ahead, Rupal. You know, Kashi Bhaiya also, yeah, I lovingly call him Kashi Bhaiya and that's what I'm going to address him. <laughs> and I've had the fortune to know him since uh, 13 long years now. He's an amazing personality, gotten trained under him. And because of him, I have really imbibed some of the, um, some of the nicest of the things which I, you know, uh, translate, you know, I, I, do it in my yoga practice and otherwise also to my participants. So, um, Bhaiya, today's topic is uh, yoga beyond body. So, you know, when I did my teacher's training course eight years ago with you all, and um, for me, I had just come, okay, I want to learn more of asanas and postures. So that was my perception about yoga. So could you elaborate on what actually is yoga beyond body? So I love the topic and I'd like to really congratulate our head of department, uh, Professor Sharmaji, to come up with an interesting topic. What I've, what I've experienced being with uh, Gurudev, Shri Ravi Shankar all these years is the fact that um, somehow uh, this whole understanding of yoga needs to change and has changed the world over. There was a time when people thought yoga was a, a person sitting on a bed of nails. From that, it became uh, associated with just Surya Namaskar. From that, it went to probably body weight management, gymnastics, nose touching the knee, etc. Today, more and more people are looking at yoga as a combination of asana, pranayama, meditation. Meditation has become a buzzword in today's service. So the way I look at it, the word yoga itself comes from the root yuj, which means to unite. And by definition, it's all about uniting the various aspects of what we are. When we think I'm just the body, then that's such a limited understanding of our existence. There's so much more. There's a mind that, uh, that perceives, there's an intellect that analyzes, there's memory that stores, there's an identity, the ego that, that uh, identifies. And so there are so many aspects to our life. And our ancient rishis um, addressed all these aspects in the tools and techniques that they offered. And for me, that's why yoga is a holistic um, tool 
to be able to to look at ourselves not as a sum of various parts but as a whole and that's why i feel yoga is much beyond the body i'm not saying that the body is not involved but it is beyond the body so when we say beyond the body it means with the body beyond the body and so that's why when uh, especially in the in the teaching of of yoga under shri shri i feel that all these aspects of yoga come out so beautifully whether it's bhakti yoga gnana yoga karma yoga all aspects of yoga right from asana to to samadhi every aspect is covered so beautifully and uh, for any sadhak for anyone aspiring on the spiritual path it's a it's a wonderful path to follow in my experience of teaching across the world i've seen that maybe many people start off with the body and that's what people understand but in the process of understanding the body there is a realization that there is something much more to life does that make sense yeah yeah so true because that is what happened with me you know after undergoing the training program i actually got a glimpse of what true yoga is thank you bhaiya on that so Absolutely. is it true that is it true that you began uh, studying uh, yoga at the doing yoga at the age of 7 i in fact uh, i would beg to differ in fact i feel that every person is born a yogi there is no one on this planet who's ever really not doing yoga so every child puts the foot in the mouth and does much more flexible asanas than any of us if if you look at the breathing of any child there's a certain rhythm to it if you look into the eyes of a child it looks as if the child is meditating so in a certain sense everyone is born a yogi and we just uh, uh, rekindle that whole experience of yoga so in a certain sense yes um, we all are yogis at the same time as we go through life we tend to forget this nature of ours and it's good to have a formal practice of learning of of experiencing the the depth of yoga so yes when i was in you know as young now that i'm old now uh i was blessed with uh, with a, by being born into a family which already was very spiritual in nature so i got uh, into the uh, i got initiated into the gayatri mantra my upanayan happened when i was young and i started meditating and of course um, i love doing asanas so i would go to the park nearby and ask people and learn on my own but the true essence of yoga came to me when i was finally in college and i got to meet gurudev shri shri ravi shankar that's when i realized that yoga is much beyond the body and though i would uh, do my japa i would meditate a little bit i would do some asanas they were all disparate practices they were all separate activities coming to gurudev brought that whole uh, idea of yoga together it made me experience how every moment in my life could become yoga and that was what really allowed yoga to flower in my life otherwise it was great it was a part of one of my tick marks in my daily activity but being with gurudev really transformed it to becoming a 24 hour practice and that's what makes yoga so beautiful nice wonderful bhaiya so um maya you became a full time teacher a full time volunteer i would say rather with the art of living uh, way back in 1995 is that true absolutely yes <laughs> and you handled a diverse portfolio since the time uh, like you are by qualification by domain you are a mechanical engineer chemical engineer chemical engineer yeah chemical engineer then after coming to the art of living you been the head of the publications divisions and you have under your guidance so many books were published edited and then you have been uh, you currently you are currently the director training of shishi school of yoga you are also you have been involved in lot of activities with the, with our heritage school the shri veda agama mahaparshala 
And currently, you are also a trustee with the Vedic Dharma Samsthana, which aims to promote the ancient Vedic culture. So, Vaya, I want to know, how do you see the synonyms in all these portfolios when you are working from the aspect of yoga? So, the way I look at it, yoga encompasses all activities in life. It's like, um, when I say I'm breathing, breathing is the, the essence for my life itself. In the, same, in the same way, I would say the principles of yoga are so universal that every aspect of life gets impacted by it. When I was in college, I remember, I always used to think I needed 28 hours in my life. There was so much to do and so less time to do it. In. That's when I started doing the Sudarshan Kriya, started meditating, started really understanding the, the, the totality of, of the yogic experience. And I found something wonderful happening. My sleep cut down from eight to six hours and I was still efficient the whole day. I realized that investing my time in yoga actually gave me much more time. And that's when I started investing my time in yoga. And as I started doing that, I realized that my life was becoming more efficient. My relationships became better. I was not reacting so fast. My football improved. My re reflexes improved. Every aspect of my life started being affected by yoga in a very positive way. And I realized that if there is something that can impact every aspect of my life, that's worth pursuing, that's worth looking at. And that's how I saw that whether it is Vedic sciences, whether it is chemical engineering, whether it's publishing a book, somewhere it all boils down to the state of our mind. The quality of our life depends on the state of our mind. And if there's something that can change that state of the mind, that's yoga. That's why I would say if someone is very busy, then, hey, yoga is so, so necessary for you. It's almost like a, like an, uh, like a need because this is investing time in yoga is what can allow us to get more time from life. And investing time in yoga is what can make the rest of our life much more efficient. And that's how I feel that if if um, if I can if I can experience this, I should be able to share this experience. And that's how that's what inspired me to become a teacher. And today, when I teach so many people and I see such transformation happening in people's life, it just reinforces this fact that yoga is not just a a, a part time activity; it is the basis of all other activities. And when we understand this, when we are able to experience this. When this becomes a part of our, from our life, it actually gives us much more time in our life. Yeah. So beautiful. So beautifully put, that is the basis of all activities. So beautiful. You know, you also have a background in Sanskrit. And uh, you have a lot of knowledge on Vedas and Upanishads. So could you please share one of your favorite shlokas? in context of our today's topic and could you please elaborate on it? So I would say that maybe everyone thinks I'm a scholar in Vedic sciences, but truly all of this is just my guru's blessings. It's just being able to be in his presence to, to experience the knowledge <clears throat> from a living master makes it all come alive. So of course, there has been uh, some amount of study that has gone in, but really all of that on one side and the Guru's grace on the other side. I often talk about this as the distinction between para-vidya and apara-vidya. There is knowledge that comes through grace and through blessings and knowledge that comes through effort. So I, I firmly believe in, in both of them, but definitely depend more on the para-vidya, allow the grace to function. I'm, uh, the way I look at it, there are so many aspects, there are so many shlokas, there are so many sayings about yoga. And for me, the yoga chitta vritti nirodha of the Patanjali Yoga Sutra truly embodies, truly represents the, the principle of yoga, the, the essence of yoga. Chitta vritti nirodha. 
chitta is our consciousness the antakarana the the various modes of our consciousness and vritti is modulation now this word vritti is a very beautiful word it has, it's very difficult to translate into english and for example if i have a kurta and i crush it then this is the same kurta but now it has lines on it and if i iron it those lines go away it's still the same cloth those lines appeared and went away they were just modulations in the same way our mind our our intellect our memory our ego all of this experience modulation there is a quiescent state and there is a modulated state when the modulations are there then that's what appears for example if i crush my kurta people look at the crease and say hey it's a crushed kurta but when i iron it people don't look at the creases and they say it's a kurta and they are able to see the reality in the same way when all these creases get ironed out all the vrittis get ironed out then i am able to experience truly who i am and for me this is the essence of yoga whether i'm doing asana whether i'm doing pranayama meditation whether i'm doing service whether i'm in the, indulging in uh, in experiencing the depth of knowledge whether i'm experiencing bhakti all the different forms of yoga allow us to get this chitta vritti nirodha happen to allow us to sublimate all these restrain these modulations that come through and for me the patanjali yoga sutra holds the key for any yoga sadhak for anyone who wants to go really deeper in the practice and the and the understanding of yoga the yoga sutra is such an amazing text and gurudev shri shri ravi shankar ji has done such a beautiful work in elucidating in in un, uncovering in unlocking the secrets of the patanjali yoga sutra it's amazing and the more i read through the text the more i listen to the talks it just makes me feel so grateful that this knowledge has existed since time immemorial and it's available to us in such purity after all these years don't you think so rupal it's so amazing that there, that all this knowledge has survived and and it's still available to us absolutely So there was this question which came to us: uh, What is the significance of yoga in Vedic literature? I would say that um, the Vedic literature, um, you'll find a lot of of texts there, and uh, most of the Vedic literature, you'll find that the there are some. darshanas the way of looking at the vedic literature and these are usually called the shat darshanas the six darshanas so nyaya vaisheshika sankhya yoga mimamsa and vedanta now the practices the tools of yoga you'll find are universal so whether you are wanting to um, whether you wanting to recognize the vedas through the advaita vedanta or whether you want to recognize the vedas through the dvaita vedanta or through sankhya any of these things the tools of yoga help us to experience that i remember once gurudev shri shri ravi shankar ji was saying that just because you are a vedanti doesn't mean you don't use the practices of yoga and just a couple of days back in the narad bhakti sutra gurudev was i think it was maybe it was today itself he said this thing very beautifully he said for uh, for experiencing for the advaita the conscious for adoring the consciousness he said that atmarati avirodhena iti shandilya the ability to be fully in bliss with oneself this is what shandilya says but to achieve that deva bhakti is a very good tool to achieve atmarati atm bhakti so just like maybe every path of of the of darshana has its own end goal inside the tools of yoga help us to achieve each of those end goals 
and that's why i feel that the practices of yoga you will find everywhere so if it's mimamsa then even in the karma kanda in the puja vidhi you'll always find some pranayam happening pranayami when yoga is always there sankhya talks of the various uh, koshas pancha kosha etc and the same how to 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 optimize these layers of our existence yoga is the way so inish so i would actually say yoga as a philosophy is beautiful at the same time yoga as a practice is a basis for all other uh, forms of uh, various philosophies as a means to achieving the end goal so to speak so yes you will find references to yoga in various vedas you will find references to to the tools of yoga in in all other uh, aspects of the vedic literature also at the same time these uh, paths are not really contradictory but complementary when we recognize this then we are really able to appreciate the the vastness of of the vedic thought our ancient rishis were uh, were really very 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 smart i would say they recognized that every person had their own hmm, priorities had their own characteristics so some people love singing some people love talking some people love action and so they said for every person there is some way to achieve the goal and that's how our ancient rishis were never very didactic they never said um my way or the highway but they said whatever way you choose here's the tool here's what you can do and achieve the end result and i think that's the beauty of the vedic thought that they allowed all these various forms the various darshanas to coexist and not fight among each other so beautiful Rupal, you're not audible. I don't know whether you're able to hear. Well, I'm actually not sorry, Bhaiya. I'm Kashi Bhaiya, but. Now, yeah. yeah now you are okay so uh, what would be the role of yoga in human evolution the role of yoga in human evolution i think um, humanity has been evolving since time immemorial there is no two ways about it uh, and and the way the vedic uh, literature looks at this it's all circular satyuga comes then treta then dwapar then kaliyuga and then again satyuga so in the vedic uh, way of life it's all all of evolution is also circular and that's what we see in in today's uh, context too life seems to be going back to the basics nowadays with all the the lockdown and nature rejuvenating herself of course people are going through a lot of challenging situations but what's life without a challenge so the way I, the way i i see it that it is the tools of yoga that can help us to face the challenges and that's how evolution can happen if i want to build my muscles i go to the gym and lift weights unless i keep lifting the weights i'm not really going to build my body unless i keep doing the exercise which is a challenge i'm not able to build my muscles and when i know the right tools if i have the right weights and i have the right trainer then i'm able to build my muscles better i can even go to the gym and do some crazy stuff maybe i'll end up hurting myself so having a trainer and having the right tools allows me to take on the challenges and really uh, achieve something more to really grow and that's why for evolution we need both of these things the trainer that's the guru and the tools that's the techniques and when we are able to do both when we are 
when we have the good fortune of having both of these, then it allows us to really evolve on this path. I still remember when I, how I was before I did the Sudarshan Kriya. And when I look back at my life, it seems as if um, that person was such a different person. Today, when I look at how far I've come, it truly feels that life has been on a fast forward. It seems as if evolution has happened so much more faster than what had happened when I was not meditating. So we are all on the path and we are all growing. But when we have the right tools and the right trainer, then we can grow faster. And I think that's what uh, I feel we are, we are so lucky that we are able to do. Yes, Bhaiya. I had you as my trainer. <laughs> <laughs> How do I know that I am pushing myself hard enough while I am learning or aiming at achieving a particular yoga posture or a yoga practice? Or should I even push myself? The Yoga Sutra says, Prayatna Shaitilya Ananta Samapatti Nyam. Prayatna, effort. Shaitilya, letting go. And that's why both of these are very essential. Unless you put the effort, there's no way you can let go. And if you just put the effort but don't let go, then also something is lost. So, where to put the effort and where to let go. Gurudev says very beautifully that when you're riding a bicycle, if you, the way to balance is when you feel that you're leaning to one side, then you lean to the other. And this becomes so natural that you don't even think about doing this. In a certain sense, as we practice our yoga, there is an innate sense of rightness in the Vedic scriptures. This is called Rita. Rita. And uh, uh, the Yoga Sutra says, Ritam bhara tatra pragya. The awareness becomes Ritam bhara, knowing what is right. What we call the, the inner voice or the consciousness or, or conscience. So in a certain sense, we all have this ability to know exactly what is right and what's wrong for me. And we all know exactly when we are pushing too much. And we all know exactly when we are too, getting too lazy. The reality truth is somewhere in the middle, neither being lazy nor overdoing things. And when we start listening to our inner voice, then it tells us very clearly where, how much and where to do. So, and when, for the times that we uh, don't have that inner voice or when we are not in a position to listen to it or the noise is too much, that's when a guru helps. So, I think, I believe that we all have the ability to, to log in to the rightness of this existence. And when we do that, then we are able to take the right decisions. Often, when we are in a confusion, we think taking a decision will give us the, will release the confusion. But actually, removing the confusion allows us to take the right decision. So we often tend to put the cart before the horse. So all we need to do is remove the confusion. And that's why meditation, yoga, all these practices help us to attain the right, to remove the confusion and get to the right decision. So in a particular asana, if you're not, if you don't know how much to do, how to do, then as you keep practicing, you know exactly what is your limit the body has a very innate mechanism for telling you what's your limit. For example, if I take my finger and I keep pressing it, then this is how much it will go. If I try to keep pushing it till it reaches the wrist, then there is something that is, that, that is not designed to do. But if I write letters and I write 10 pages and I've not really written for a long time, my hands still pain, the fingers still pain. But that's the pain of having done something which I'm not used to doing. Whereas this is the pain of doing something that I'm not designed to do. Learning to recognize between these two types of pain is what helps us in perfecting our asana. Of course, uh, that's why when we are, especially when we're doing our asanas, it's always good to learn from a teacher first. And, uh, and the teacher is able to tell you sometimes when you're totally confused, 
confused that is this uh, type A pain or type B pain. Sometimes we confuse one for the other and become lazy or we confuse the other for the one and become over enthusiastic. That's why initially it's very good to start with a yoga teacher and because everyone's unique. Though I said, gave this example, maybe some people can bend more, some people can bend less. If we err on the side of caution, then we become lazy. If we err on the side of enthusiasm, we become over enthusiastic and both can create problems. So always good to start with a teacher and then practice on our own. For all those who are watching live on Facebook, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to write it in the comments and we'll, we'll be monitoring them and asking some of them. Thank you, Bhaiya, for that. So this is a very sincere and innocent uh, question, I would say, that has come up. What should be the real intention behind my yoga practice or should I even keep any intention? It's always good to have an intention in any practice, uh, in any puja, you'll find there is always a sankalpa, an intention. And the intention could be something that's life supportive. For example, supposing you want to take a, take a flight to Bombay and uh, maybe the flights have opened up or maybe they've closed. Or let's say you want to take a flight to Bangalore and there is a flight available, all you do is you book your ticket and then you continue doing whatever work you're doing. If every moment after you bought the ticket, you keep thinking, I want to go to Bombay, I want to go to Bangalore, I want to go to Bangalore, then you'll go crazy. So an intention or a sankalpa is just that. We start with that intention and then just get, uh, get going with things. It's not that throughout every asana, every pranayama, every meditation, I keep taking my attention to the intention. No, that's counterproductive. But the way to take a sankalpa, in fact, if in the puja, if you've ever seen how people take a sankalpa, they take some rice and flowers in the hands and offer it. A sankalpa is meant to be offered. It's like you go to a cinema hall, you have a ticket, and you give the ticket to the, to the watchman, and the watchman tears it, and only then you're allowed to go inside. In the same way, every sankalpa works by offering it. So any sankalpa that you want, any intention, may you know, life be uplifted, may the world benefit. The more limited the sankalpa, the less powerful it is. But when your sankalpa is for the whole world, then it becomes much more powerful. So it's a great idea before your yoga practice to just have this thing that, hey, let everyone, let the whole world benefit. Let everyone be a part of this wonderful endeavor. Usually at the end of every session also, some Shanti Mantra, something is chanted. And all these Shanti Mantras are so beautiful that they allow us to, to experience the peace and to share the peace with everyone on this planet. Thank Does that make sense, Rupal? Yes, yes, very much. How to get rid of habits that come up again and again? Hmm. Gurudev says, if you want to make a habit or break a habit, then the way to do that is to take time-bound commitments or short vows. When we say, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, then we tend to break it very fast. Every New Year resolution is broken on January 1st or January 2nd at the latest. So, but when I say, okay, for two days, for five days, for 10 days, I'm going to do this, then it seems doable. And when we complete one set, then we get that sense of achievement that yes, I can do it. And that allows us to really reinforce our internal will to be able to make that habit. For example, if your habit is, uh, that you wake up late and you want to change that and you want to start waking up early. You want to create a habit of waking early. Then you say, okay, let, next two days I'm going to wake up early. And when you finish that, then you say, hey, this is doable. And that gives you the enthusiasm to continue the practice. But if you say for the rest of my life, I'm going to get up at 4 a.m. Next day you say, well, let me hit the snooze button. And then you feel so much guilt. Itni atma glani ho jati hai. Then 
you, it just doesn't help you to stay on the on your commitments so time bound commitments short term commitments going on to long term commitments that's the way to really build up a build up a habit or break that habit thank you we experience a glimpse of samadhi after samyama so how to be in that state for the rest of the day i would say uh, by dropping the rest of the day part of that statement often when we experience something we want it to stay always or we want to let it be there in the future as soon as the mind goes into the future we have dropped our attention on that state so the better question to ask could be how can i be in this state right now and in that process of being in that state right now it stays second thing i would say the nature of existence is change everything is changing and when we are able to accept this when we are able to realize this that's when um, life blossoms otherwise we tend to hold on to the past and get stuck so much with the past that we are not able to move on just imagine if you are driving a car and you had the handbrakes on then the brakes also get damaged and the car also doesn't go fast in the same way in life it's always a good idea not to keep the brakes on not to keep your mind hooked on to the past or the future but to be in the present and the way to do that is sudarshan kriya very beautifully the sudarshan kriya allows us to really get rid of the hooks of the past or the anxiousness of the of the future and allows us to really be ourselves and for me this is the tool of yoga that really makes such a big difference to our life yeah uh, so true so true but yeah you handled uh, you being part of such big events ियंस while handling any of the bigger events one thing i have realized is that hmm, this idea this uh, feeling that i am handling it gives so much of a headache but when you recognize that there is a higher power that's uh, that's running the show then we are able to give our 100% achieve a lot and yet not be bogged down by it. Uh, you know the uh, yoga sutras talk about a very beautiful technique it says ishvara pranidhana by mm, recognizing a higher power ishvara the lord that which has a say over this whole existence so for example i have lordship over some items maybe i can touch the mouse button and either press it or not press it i can decide to log on to a zoom call or not log on to a zoom call so there are so many things that are under my purview but there are some things which are not under my purview to decide how another person will behave is not under my purview so but there is something that's running this whole creation that has lordship over this whole creation when i recognize that there is something that's running this creation that allows me to settle down and really be more efficient at what i'm doing it's a very fine line between recognizing the the lordship in creation and becoming lazy ourselves in there is a famous doha that says ajgar kare na chakri panchi kare na kaam das maluka keh gaye sabka data ram there was a saint who das maluka who who said this but it was said in a very different context unfortunately people use it very differently and say hey gurudev will take care of everything i will not do anything jab unki ichha hogi tab hum aake dhyan karenge but in handling the biggest events what i truly recognized was that along with the effort when there is surrender that's the most beautiful combination 
surrender in the name of surrender when we become inactive that's not truly surrender that's not ishvara pranidhana but ishvara pranidhana really encompasses all your action and the freedom from the action i think this combination is something so unique and every time i have been part of a bigger event it has allowed me to experience this and reinforce this knowledge and allowed me to use this in whatever else that i'm doing so i feel that you know, the experience of the bhagavad gita the experience of the yoga sutras is what comes when we engage in some activity in some so in in the karma yoga there is truly freedom isn't this also going beyond the body yoga Absol- beyond the body absolutely you said it so that's where i felt that yoga is truly something so much more deeper to our existence than the superficial aspect of just the body again i don't say i don't mean to be little the body or say hey asanas are not real yoga real yoga is this no. it is through the asanas asan truly means an asan a seat a, a foundation and just imagine if you had lot of buildings that were built but no foundation and you're an architect too so i guess you can appreciate this example even better if you, if the foundation is weak then the whole building suffers and one little gust of wind and things can blow away but just imagine if you have a city just full of foundation but no buildings then it's no point what's the point of doing all that effort with the foundation and not building a building on top of it so both are essential when we have our foundations clear then the building stays stable and that's how the practice of yoga become more stable and this is our experience when we are doing a good asana sequence and then meditating the experience is completely different the days we have done a really good asana sequence for us life seems to be much more clearer so at the same time if you're just meditating and not doing asanas a lot of time you'll find that your meditation becomes a little flaky and you're not able to meditate small things can irritate you or take you off balance so well rounded practice of both asana pranayama meditation in applying the principles of yoga in our life a lot of people think oh i'm doing a 2 hour yoga sequence but let me forget the rest of the day that has nothing to do with yoga but if you can just practice the yama niyama all the principles of yoga in during our whole day i think that is what really helps us to to blossom as yogis otherwise just imagine if you decided that you are going to wear clothes only for 2 hours in your day and the rest of the day you're not going to wear any clothes you'll not be able to get out of your room so in the same way i think yoga is not a garment to be put on and put off but it's actually something that is that stays throughout throughout our life and when we make that happen then we experience the totality of yoga and that what that's what makes yoga blossom for us so beautifully yes priya yes, yeah. uh, i'm going to take liberty to ask you about your college days now <laughs> <laughs> there is something about your iit days there is something very very naughty that you did something something really crazy you had the company of the best teachers who are the best teachers now actually when i was in I, actually when i was in college everyone felt the most craziest thing that i had ever done was to join the art of living foundation <laughs> i i remember uh, i decided that on one side was what i wanted to do and the other side was what i had to do and i chose what i wanted to do so i came to the ashram became a full time sevak in the ashram and then finally gurudev had to say come on go finish your study so i went back finished and then i came back but i i remember still that ever since i started meditating i just didn't it my purpose in life became so so clear to me and i think that for many of us as we go through life having a clarity of purpose is sometimes so elusive and sometimes when you find that clarity of purpose it seems crazy to other people and i think that's what uh, 
people felt at that time today when i go back to alumni meetings when i meet other batchmates everyone feels that hey you took such a great courageous decision that you were able to actually follow what you really wanted to do and and somehow i think when i look back at my life i would not change my decisions for anything at all and that i think that was probably the craziest thing that i ever did in in college i mean of course i did lots of crazy things but so apart from yeah that's the craziest thing but we would like to hear one more crazy thing that you did <laughs> Days. you know i was Share. actually um um i was actually into a lot of theater i would uh, i remember the performing arts festival i loved production and um, it was so much fun to put the sets together to get the costumes done oh, so you uh, were into production as well my god <laughs> so many things diverse things that you've done so yeah it was it was very interesting. interesting and uh, of course i was a generally nice guy one thing that we all used to do in iit was talk about topics endlessly at night and with no reason at all there would be heated discussions about environment about some vague topics and the next day would all be back doing whatever we were doing so i still remember this uh, the crazy discussions that we used to have middle of the night um, and i think somewhere all those uh, all those activities actually helped us to 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 engage with the intellect and and really uh, become what we were today okay. where you visited so shishi Yeah, good. Yeah, I was asking that um, you visited Shishu University so many times. And uh, mm-hmm. Shishu University is a beautiful campus, sprawling over 188 acres, and we have a plethora of programs that we offer. And yoga, we offer bachelor's and master's degree in yoga. What is it that you really like about Shishu University? Well, you know, if you ask any student. then uh, anyone would say the food one thing i uh, was amazed at was the kind of learning environment that was there in the in the university i've visited a qu- quite a few times and i feel that the uh, one thing that is that people don't really realize is how important a learning environment is for learning to happen it's not the subject matter it's not just the the textbooks or or all the other accessories but a learning environment that kindles the the mindset of learning and if that is there then everything else gets taken care of i still remember from my college days going to iit it was all about exercising the intellect really thinking about things and those times that we spend outside the department i mean of course during the department hours also in the lectures a lot of thing did happen but i feel that as a personality we grow when we have a good learning environment and for uh, to actually have a drug free uh, alcohol free campus something that can really enhance our learning skills i think this is something so so important what people don't realize is that alcohol and drugs actually inhibit our learning abilities so it's quite counterproductive to campus for all this happening. of course asking um, a student during their student days it would be completely maybe they have a different idea of what learning is but going having gone through all of this i feel this is something that ssu truly is is, is offering that is so unique the the other thing is the ability to come up with creative projects there are so many things happening on campus that people can engage and do a hundred myriad activities the third important thing which i feel also is so un- so so unique with shishri university is that it's able to harness the shishri part of its name and shishri being a truly a world citizen 
the the very fact that the organization is present in so many countries we're able to leverage the the talents that we have across the world and bring such an international ambiance and experience to students in the shishi university i think that's something so unique and so so amazing so i feel that all in all these are some of the aspects that that are so beautiful that are so um, inspiring and that are so useful for any student on any path so i really congratulate the whole university team and the and people who look after the campus to really create such a beautiful learning environment and tashi bhai also visits us often we are thankful to you please visit us more often <laughs> thank you rupal so now that i have not been able to visit in person then we are visiting on on facebook like this we'll definitely do more interactions i remember just two weeks back i was teaching some sessions on, on the on on campus on a virtual campus and it feels so so beautiful so fulfilling to be able to give back uh, all those all that i have received sorry i couldn't hear that rupal Can you hear me, Bhaiya? No, yeah. I think it went off. And I think this is something that really uh, exemplifies what yoga is, because a lot of times the environment creates problems for us. The network connection goes down. But it, at these times, if we can maintain the smile and and continue the with whatever is happening, that's what yoga truly is. so that's how i would say that yoga is much more than the body and yeah, come experience the 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 purity the the amazement that yoga is and i think shishi university now has short term courses also for yoga and uh, so those of us who would like to do a short term course i think all these opportunities are there come it's an amazing campus virtually or physically and uh, i would like to welcome all our viewers those of us who are watching uh, that uh, there is something very magical about the shishi university come and see for yourself jai gurudev